between being convinced and convicted. You know, we've got a lot of young people in the church today who are convinced that there is a God. But are they convicted? Are they convicted enough to actually allow it to change their life? You just know as the prime example, a, a man who was convinced that there is a God. But folks, listen to me. If he was never, ever convicted, he would have never picked up that hammer. Can you just imagine it for a moment? God says, no, I want you to build a boat, and here's how I want you to do it. And he says, you know what? I'm convinced you're real, God. And he leaves it at that. Folks, do you realize all life on earth would have perished? If all he did was say, yes, God, I am convinced you're real. This morning, I want you to understand it takes more than being just convinced. We as Christians must be convicted. Now, I realize that everybody in this room has got a lot going on in your lives. I'm excited about the fact that we're starting a lectureship together. This morning, for just a few minutes, what I want you to do is I want you to set aside everything that's going on in your world. And for just a few minutes, I want you to focus on God's Word. I want you to open up your heart, and I want you to look at what the Scripture says. During our Bible class hour, we looked at Psalm chapter 78, and we talked about the importance of, of teaching future generations, children yet unborn. I want you to revisit Psalm 78 for just a moment, because the story did not conclude there. If we look a little bit further in that chapter, we read about the children of Ephraim. Psalm 78, starting in verse 9, take a look at what it says. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in His law. They forgot His works and His wonders that He had showed them. Here you've got a group of people that they're armed, they're ready to do battle, but when the, the battle actually comes, the day comes, they literally set everything down and they turn away. Why in the world would our children lay down their bows and not defend God? Why, why would our kids turn their backs? Folks, I'm here to tell you, it's probably because many of us in this room, we're convinced that God's real. But we're not convicted of it. What have they watched their parents doing for decades? Right now, Satan is whispering in your ear. And he is telling you, it is all right to bring your child up in the nurture and the admonition of the world. And many of us are listening to what he's saying. want to share with the, the Bible class teachers this morning something that I'm kind of passionate about. I noticed this morning as I was teaching, there were classes going on all around the building. Those of you who teach, whether it be teenagers, whether it be three-year-olds, cradle roll, let me encourage you from this day forward, in order to, to help build a biblical worldview in their hearts and their minds, I want you to erase the words Bible stories from your vocabulary forever. And instead, I want you to start using the, the term biblical account. Because, folks, everything we read in here is real. It is true. It happened. And if our kids grow up hearing what they think are Bible stories, let me ask you what happens when our child hits 11 or 12 years of age. They come to church Sunday morning, Wednesday night, and they hear a Bible story. Monday, they head off to school, and they sit in a class, maybe a general science class, where they hear the words proof, fact, and evidence. Wednesday night, they're back at, at the church building, and they read another Bible story. Folks, pretty soon, what happens is it becomes almost like a, a myth, a fable. In fact, I think in many ways, folks, what we have done in the church, 
We have sanitized God's Word to such a point our kids don't know that it really is real. I'll give you the perfect example. The account of the flood, probably one of the best known of all the accounts of God's Word. And yet we've turned it into a kid's story. We, we paint pictures on the wall. We've got the, the toys at home, the flat books. We sing the little song, Who Built the Ark? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that those things are wrong or they're bad. I've got four children. Trust me, I've stepped on Noah's Ark a couple of times in the middle of the night. But folks, think about it for just a moment. Our kids growing up with this, this who built the ark in mind, and yet this was the deadliest event in human history. Do we honestly grasp that? Hiroshima? Child's play. D-Day? Huh. Doesn't even compare to this. 9-11 was like a joke compared to the flood, folks. This wiped out every human being and every animal save what was on the boat. I don't think we get it sometimes. This morning I want you to look at the ark in a way that some of you have never looked at it. For you see, that ark was a piece of wood that God used to deliver his elect, eight people, Noah, his wife, Shem, Ham, Japheth, wife, 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 that was a foreshadowing of another piece of wood that God would use to deliver his elect. And yet, you know what we do? We sing songs about it. We joke about it. We, we put our, our picture on our wall of our bedroom of Noah's Ark. But do we really get it? This morning, I want us to really get it. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, and I want you to look with me at the very last verse. We're going to kind of set the stage of where we are in history. Genesis chapter 5, verse 32, Noah was 500 years old and he begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So he's 500 years old. Skip down three verses later to Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for indeed he is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, a lot of people have looked at that and thought, Hey, that's, that's when God started limiting lifespans. That's not the case. And the reason that I can say that with such confidence is because there were a lot of people who lived past 120 after this declaration was made. You just saw the, the genealogies, the time charts that we put up earlier. What this is, folks, this is a probationary period. God is saying you better get things cleaned up. Now take a look at Genesis chapter 7, verse 6. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters were on the earth. He's 500 years old. God delivers a probationary warning. He said, get it cleaned up. He tells Noah, you're going to need to build a boat for me. Noah's 600 years old when the floodwaters come. A hundred years, this guy was a preacher of righteousness. Take a look at the verse we had read for us. Genesis chapter 6, verse 17. Behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which ever is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Now, folks, please do not read that and just, just let it roll off your back like water on a duck. Look at what the text is saying. Everything perished. You know, some of you in this room have probably seen animals that have drowned. Maybe you've seen what we in the uh, anatomy department call floaters, human bodies that, that drowned. They will go down in the water for many, many hours because water has filled their lungs. But after a few hours, you know what happens? They pop right back up to the surface. And they stay there 
for hours, days, even weeks, given the right conditions. Can you imagine looking off the deck of that boat and seeing all of the, the carnage, the dead bodies of both humans and animals alike, the stench that would fill your nostrils, a, a smell that you would not soon forget. Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 gives us three characteristics about this man. It says that he was a just man. That he was perfect in his generations, that he walked with God. Now, when it talks about him being perfect in his generations, does that mean he was perfect and sinless? Nope, there's only been one sinless man to ever walk this earth. That was Jesus Christ. This simply meant that, that Noah was complete, that he was doing everything God required of him. Notice the text then says he walked with God. If I asked you this morning, how many people in the Bible is that characteristic given to? Most of you quickly could come up with Enoch, right? How about Adam and Eve? God walked through the garden? But folks, here's my point. It's not more than just a handful. And yet, if we go by numbers alone, this guy was a failure. Why would I say that? Because this guy preached for a hundred years and all he saved was his own family. Take a look. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world. This guy preaches for a hundred years. Let's see, Gene's been with y'all, what, 150? Don't, don't tell him that. All he saved was his family. I mean, think about it for just a moment. What about his closest neighbor? Have you ever thought about Noah's closest neighbor, the one that had to hear the hammering? Did he get on the boat? Or what, what about Noah's best friend? You ever thought about Noah's very best friend, Surely he's going to get on the boat. But he didn't, did he? As a side note to that, did Noah go after his best friend with a, a rope and a knife saying, you know what, buddy, today you're going to get on the boat? No. He preached for 100 years and all he saved was his family. Now, please do not miss this one, church. At least he got his family on the boat. Because there's a lot of us that aren't. Right now, all throughout the nation, what we have is we've got church families that are basically trying to fill their collective bucket. Our, our church family. And we're doing various programs and different things to try to trickle in people into our bucket. All the while, we've got a massive hole in the bottom of our bucket. And the hole in the bottom is much bigger than what's coming in the top. And folks, listen to me. What is going out the bottom is the souls of our children and our grandchildren. So I'll say again, at least Noah got his family on the boat. Genesis chapter 7 verse 11. Turn there if you've got your Bibles open. The text says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. The windows of heaven were open. You ever wondered why? Why, why did Moses record so much detail here? 600th year, second month, 17th day. Folks, I'll tell you exactly why Moses recorded the detail. Because neither Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth would ever forget that day. If I mention the day 9-11 to you in this room, everybody remember that? Most of you remember where you were. And yet, the reality of it is 9-11 did not change this, this earth nearly like the flood did. This was God raining down judgment on sin. 
Here was a guy who the text says walked with God. And for just a moment, I want you to imagine being on that boat with him. The fountains of the great deep are breaking up. The windows of heaven are open. And everything that you've been doing for a hundred years, you finally put your hammer down. You, you finally stopped preaching. Do you think Noah was, was standing on the, on the deck of that boat, pounding his chest, saying, I told you so! Folks, we don't know, but I, I, I honestly, deep in my heart, I suspect the man was cowered down. I suspect he was scared to death, wondering, why me? And somebody might look at all this and say, wow, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty big commitment. A hundred years of building a boat, a hundred years of preaching righteousness. What, what was his reward? What, I mean, because let's be honest, let's, again, land the plane. Let's be totally honest about how we look at things. In modern society, we believe if we are good people that we're going to get something in return. So we ask the question, what, what was Noah's reward for his righteousness? Was it wealth? Was it material stuff? Folks, he lost everything in the flood. And I'm going to throw something at you that I bet some of you never thought about. I believe Noah was probably a wealthy man. You say, whoa, time out, Brad. It, it doesn't say that in the Bible. And you're right, absolutely it does not. But let me suggest all of you in here, think about this. I want you to go home today and I want you to build a boat to the dimensions that God gave using the resources you have. So I'll say again, I think he probably had some money. It wasn't wealth that God rewarded him with. All right. Maybe it was children. Because remember we talked in our, our Bible class this morning that even though Americans don't believe so, God views children as a blessing, a reward. So maybe that was Noah's reward for his righteousness. Go back to Genesis 5. Remember the genealogies? If you look in Genesis chapter 5, notice starting in verse Oh, let's start in verse 4. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam lived were 800 years. Notice this, and he had sons and daughters. Do you realize every single one of the lineages given? They give us the, the son of record, Seth. And then it mentions they had sons, plural, and daughters, plural. It is listed that way all the way from Adam to Lamech. Do you realize that means at the very minimum every single one of them had five kids. Son of record, sons plural, daughters plural. What about Noah? He had three. Shem, Ham, Japheth. So it wasn't kids. Alright Brad, what, what was it then? What, what did God give to Noah for his hundred years of, of righteousness. Folks, listen to me. He got to get on the boat. Have you reached that, that point in your spiritual life where you understand that your reward for righteousness is not stuff, but rather it's deliverance? We're not promised a bigger house. We're not promised a new car. We're not promised the best clothes, the best neighborhood. We're promised to get on the boat. Somebody says, how, how in the world could a loving God do that? How could a loving God kill all of those people, all of those animals? Folks, a better question is, how could a righteous God not do it? You see, we serve a righteous judge. So here's a question that I want every single one of us thinking about this morning. Who in this room believes you deserve the ark and not the floodwaters? Who in this room thinks, yeah, I ought to have a seat on that boat rather than the waters of the flood? 
Because, folks, if we're honest with ourselves, if we are completely honest with ourselves, everybody in this room probably over the last week has done something in which realistically we deserve the fires of hell. You say, whoa, time out, Brad. I, I, I didn't do anything really bad. Okay, what about our thoughts? What about our actions or, or our words or our attitudes or our neglect? Can everybody in this room look at me and tell me that within the last week we have lived a pure life to a holy God? I'll say again, we have probably done something within the last week, within the last month in which we deserve the fires of hell. Now, let me re-ask this question. How many of us really appreciate that second piece of wood? You see, the cross, it was a piece of wood that God would use to deliver His elect. The ark was that foreshadowing piece of wood that God used to deliver His elect. If my wife were here, she would tell you that during our first few years of marriage, I did all the cooking. And it wasn't because my wife was a bad cook, although since she's not here, I'll tell you she's gotten a whole lot better. It was because I, I catered all through high school. That was my job. I learned catering from a lady by the name of Maybelle Johnson, sweet woman. She was in her 60s. Every afternoon after school, I would go and, and she would teach me how to make breads, how to do cakes, how to cook for large groups of people. And, and she didn't just teach me how to cook. She also taught me about life. We spent literally hours together after school on weekends, learning, and she was always the one there ready to listen to me. And I stand before you this morning telling you during high school she was probably my best friend. But as life often happens, I graduated from high school, I went off to college. We kept in touch a little bit while I was doing my undergrad education. She wanted to know what I was going to do with my life. At that point, there was only one track. That was medicine. She was so excited. I was going into to medical school. I, I came home graduating from college. We touched base a little bit. Then I got married. And our paths grew even colder. I went off to medical school. Lost track of her. Made a, a pretty major change in my life. Decided to become a, a physician of the soul rather than a physician of the body. About three years ago, I was driving to Abilene, Texas. I'll never forget it. Sun was beginning to set. Abilene, the roads are very straight and very flat. Got a call on my cell phone. It was Abel's grandchild. He'd called me. He'd actually gotten my phone number. Somehow he had gotten a, a copy of Think Magazine, recognized my name, called my office, talked to my office manager out of my cell phone number and was calling me. He said, Brad Maybell is in the hospital. She's about to have surgery. She wants desperately to talk to you. So I called her. And we caught up and I spent no less than 30 minutes catching up with her, talking. I prayed for her. She told me, she said, Brad, we've just moved to, to Chapel Hill, Tennessee. I don't have a phone yet, but let me give you my address. And I did what we all sometimes do. I scrambled around in the car looking for a piece of paper and a pen, and I, I scratched out her address on a piece of paper. We said our goodbyes. I did my seminar that weekend, and we got home in, in Tennessee, and I looked for that piece of paper. And I never found it. Looked under the seats, looked in my children's things, never found that piece of paper. In fact, in one day I actually took off work, driving around Chapel Hill, hoping beyond hope just to, to maybe see her outside. She'd already been discharged from the hospital. I literally lost track of her again. 
The next call that I got was about a year after that when I learned that my friend had died. She had died without me telling her the one thing she really needed to hear. And folks, listen to me. That will haunt me. The fact that my best friend in high school stepped out into eternity not prepared. And yet I bet if we're honest this morning, I suspect every one of us has somebody in that category. Somebody who may be an extended family member or a, a co-worker or a best friend. Somebody who we know right this moment is lost. But for whatever reason, we, we haven't opened the door to the one conversation we need to have. Well, folks, let me tell you what. People are dying every single minute of the day. On the screen behind me, you see the... the Death rate in the United States, you'll notice that every hour, 6,316 people step out into eternity. 6,316. In fact, 105 people die every single minute. 151,000 people die every single day. We're going to have a lectureship that goes on till Thursday. Do the math for just a moment. And while we don't like to think about it, every single one of us came into this world with an expiration date. A date that we won't miss. A date that, that quite literally will be the day. We don't like to think about the end of life much. In fact, when you listen to people pray and you listen to people, even in the church, talking about death, the fact of the matter is we view death as a failure and we're scared of it. We certainly don't like to talk about hell. In fact, what do we do? We laugh at it. We joke about it. We got little cartoons about it. Well, folks, let me remind everybody in this room. The Bible speaks of heaven. And it also speaks of a place called hell. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 2 says, It is better to go to a house of mourning than it is to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. I, I, I'm going to say something that is so different from what our, our modern world thinks about. I think instead of taking our kids to Six Flags or, or to some kind of fun park, maybe what we need to do is spend a little bit of time in the cemetery. So that they fully understand this world is not our home. We're just passing through. But Rob Bell wrote a, a book called Love Wins. Rob Bell is a denominational, very charismatic preacher. He wrote a book called Love Wins that is on the bestseller list right now. It has been read by countless millions of people. It is Rob Bell's position that if there really is a hell, which he doesn't really think so, that, that it's not going to be everlasting. In fact, he says the phrase eternal punishment should be translated as a, quote, period of pruning or a time of trimming. Listen to this quote. Bell says, if we want hell, if we want heaven, they're ours. That's how love works. It can't be forced, manipulated, or coerced. It always leaves room for the other to decide. God says, yes, we can have what we want because love wins. Well, folks, last time I checked, the words of Jesus Christ are still very real and very much authoritative. Christ said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Did Jesus say these are going to go into a time of pruning? Uh, a period of trimming? In fact, take a look. Matthew chapter 8 verse 12. He said, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
What are you saying, Jesus? Are you saying that, that love wins and that there's really not a bad place? Folks, he's saying just the opposite. In fact, Jesus Christ goes on to say, this place exists and it is so bad that if your hand causes you to sin, you need to cut it off. He said, it is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell in which the fire that shall never be quenched where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Matthew cha Mark chapter 9 verse 43 and following. Folks, Jesus Christ viewed this to be a place of torment. A, a very real place. In fact... Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, we are told that it is a place of brimstone and fire where the beast and the false prophet are. They will be tormented, notice this church, day and night forever and ever. What are you saying, Brad? Young people, listen to me for just a moment. I'm saying that after you've been in this place called hell for 150,000 years, you know what you've got to look forward to? Eternity there. I mean, think about it for just a moment. If you knew in your heart of hearts after 150,000 years, maybe, just maybe, you might be able to, to go from hell up to heaven. You might be able to hold on. But after you've been there for 150,000 years, you've got 150,000 more to look forward to and 150 more thousand after that and 150 more thousand after that. Revelation 21 verse 8. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Folks, I'm afraid that we've raised a generation, probably two, that have never heard what I call is a hellfire and brimstone sermon. There are some of you in this room that you will remember probably what got you down the aisle to be baptized was a fiery preacher up in a pulpit preaching a hellfire dam damnation type of sermon. He was giving it. He was bringing the heat, so to speak. And you say, but Brad, it's okay because my God is a God of love and grace. He's the God of the New Testament. Well, let me remind everybody in this room, the God of the New Testament is the same God as the Old Testament. He is immutable. And folks, I'm afraid if we don't really understand the wrath of God, how can we understand the love and the grace fully? If we don't comprehend the wrath. Simply put, we have forgotten that sin separates us. Take a look again at Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2. Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. You are of pure eyes than to behold evil. And you cannot look on wickedness. What are you saying, Brad? I'm saying maybe somewhere along the way we have forgotten just how holy God is. We live in a world in which internet pornography is epidemic. We live in a world in which same-sex marriage <laughs> is now the norm. We live in a world in which Filth is on the television at night on prime time and we don't think a whole lot about it. And yet the Bible says you are of purer eyes than to behold evil. I believe that in the United States of America we are practicing idolatry. Now understand I'm not saying Crude idolatry. I'm not saying that we're, we're worshiping some little graven image. No, I think we are practicing what I call refined idolatry. What is that? Refined idolatry is when we recast God 
and we rob him of who he really is. Basically, what we're doing is we're recasting God in our image. Let me remind everybody in this room what the statistics say. The statistics right now say that 87 to 90% of our society believes in a place called heaven. That's interesting. In a way, it's kind of encouraging because that means that there's still people out there that believe there's a God. Here's the interesting part to me. 70 to 74% only believe in hell. In other words, we just dropped roughly 20%. Of those, only 67% believe in Satan. We got our work cut out for us. We got to go back and we got to think about this from a big view perspective. And we got to ask ourselves, have we sanitized God's word so much that our kids don't even know? This morning, I want you to, as I said, put everything else aside. And I want you to imagine peeling back the lid on hell. What, what do you think if God allowed us just for maybe five seconds to glance down and, and to see what it's really like, what do, you think it would, what do you think it would look like? What do you think it would smell like? Or what do you think it would sound like? When I was doing my medical training, I spent several years working at Vanderbilt University Medical Center Worked in the emergency department, the, the intensive care unit. But the place that I, I loathed, loathed the most, the one place I didn't really want to go was the burn unit. Because folks, listen to me. Those were individuals who were in pain all the time. And you could smell it in the air. And yet, I'm afraid what's happening is we become comfortable and we know we've got family members who are lost and we know we've got co-workers who are lost, but we're afraid to say something because we're afraid it might, might mess up that relationship. We satisfy ourselves into thinking that maybe, maybe just maybe God's grace and love is going to cover everything. Folks, again, that is refined idolatry. That is what the world is teaching. I'm afraid that we have forgotten that, that sin is a big deal. Let me refresh everybody's memory about what God is really like. We all know of, of for instance, John 3.16. We know of passages that speak about His love and His grace. And please understand... I understand that yes, he loves us. He sent his son here. And I'm counting on his grace. But take a look with me. Jeremiah chapter 30. Starting in verse 23. The Bible says, Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goes forth with fury. A continuing whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not return until he has done it. And until he has performed the intents of his heart in these later days, you will consider it. The Bible talks about the Lord going forth with fury. Oh, but you want a better definition? You, you want to hear a, a better description? Take a look at Nahum. Chapter 1, starting in verse 2. God is jealous. And the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. He reserves his wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. I am afraid that we've forgotten to teach this generation that there really is a place called hell. And according to the Bible, broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. You look at Matthew chapter 22, the parable of the wedding feast where Jesus is saying, Then the king said to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right now, what I want you to do for just a moment is I want you to imagine that one person that you haven't talked to. 
that one person that you know right now as you're sitting in this room that's lost. And I want you to imagine them being bound hand and foot and thrown into outer darkness. Do you think it's worth talking to them? You know, sadly, we don't even like to talk about this whole character, this portrait of God, because the whole idea of vengeance, the whole idea of wrath, it scares us. So what do we do? We paint the devil as a, a character with horns and a pitchfork, and we go on living our lives mocking God. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Are we mocking God today? Folks, listen to me. I, I believe that there are some of us sitting here who in all honesty, we are offering dung to the nostrils of God. I, I, you think about some of the television shows that we're watching in the evening. All the while we've got on our wall, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Folks, that is dung in the nostrils of God. There's some of us in this room who may be, be going to internet sites or looking at books that we shouldn't be looking at. Again, that is dung in the nostrils of God. There may be some of us who are dressing immodestly. And deep down we know it. Or maybe it's the music that we're listening to that has vulgar lyrics. And we justify saying, oh, but it's, it's the popular music. It's, it's what's going on right now. And all of the older people in this room are thinking, none of that applies to me. Well, what about gossip? What about how we treat our mates? You see, there's a lot of ways that we offer up the wrong thing to the nostrils of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. This morning... I want to ask every single person in this room, are you ready to take that step? I don't know everybody here. I see some very familiar faces. I don't know all of your situations. But I suspect in this room there's at least one or two of you who are not baptized. Maybe you've been coming every single Sunday for the last decade. Or maybe you've hit that, that age of 12, 13, 14, and you're finally coming into a, a realization that, that, you know what, I, I've done some things that God doesn't want me to do. Let me ask you, what are you waiting on? If you understand that Jesus Christ came to this earth, and he died for your sins. And you're willing to repent of those sins. To confess his name. So that one day he will confess you before the Father. If you're ready to be immersed for the remission of your sins. What are you waiting on? Can you look up at me and you say, Well Brad, I've I kind of been waiting on a sign. Well guess what? Your sign flew in from Nashville last night. Here I am. Don't wait another day. Because folks, hell is a real place. And right now, if you haven't made that decision, you are quite literally hanging over it by a thread one heartbeat away. For those of us who are Christians, I started out by asking you the question, is there a difference in being convinced and convicted? I want to finish this lesson by asking you, are you convinced or are you convicted? Because there is a difference. I understand that when a preacher starts his invitation, most of the time what we do is we start thinking about lunch. Don't worry, it'll still be there. I want to extend this invitation primarily to the Christians in this room. Because you see, Satan's got another weapon that he uses against us, and it's called apathy. 
If he, can, if he can make us think that we're okay just living in the rut that we're in, going through the same motions that we go through, never truly growing, he's got us right where he wants us. We never reach out and we never talk to that neighbor. We never talk to that coworker. We never talk to the extended family member. He's got you right where he wants you. This morning I'm asking you, don't just be convinced in a place called hell and heaven. Be convicted. If you are here, you need to make changes in your life. You realize, you know what? I haven't been the faithful Christian I need to be. Maybe I, I haven't told some people I need to tell. Maybe I've grown kind of lukewarm. I'm begging you this morning to make the change. Don't let Satan win. If you have any need this morning, please, I'd ask you to come as together we stand and we sing. All things are ready. Ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be rich.